I should tell you what this cyclotron is. It's not in your book, uh, but it's such a cool object. I really enjoy talking about it. Now, so this is a device to accelerate electrons to very, very high velocities. All right. Now, how do you accelerate electrons? For example, the old TVs, the cathode ray, big, not flat screen TVs, they had what's called an electron gun. And what's an electron gun? Okay, so basically I have, hmm, let's see, a capacitor which I cannot draw here. <laughs> so it must be some magic capacitor. Let me try to make, ah, oh, good, so I can do horizontal lines. Let's stick with that. And funny enough, I actually needed a hole in this, okay? <laughs> now, let's say I hook this up to a battery. Okay. I'm going to excuse you for today because I, I don't know why. I'm feeling very uh, good today. I haven't ha slept enough, so I'm not my usual grumpy self. Now, uh, if I have a plus charge here and minus charge voltage V here. And somehow I discharge electrons from the lower plate of the capacitor. What will this electron do? It will be attracted to the plus charges. If there's a comment, you should go ahead and make it. No? Okay. So, what will this electron do? It will be accelerated and it will go out with kinetic energy equal to charge of the electron times whatever voltage you're applying. Now, maybe you can say, hey, can I make the electron pass through this many times? Okay? So, I know how to turn the electron. I can turn it by applying a magnetic field. So one guy had the following idea. He said, hey, let me take again this uh, capacitor with a small hole here. I'm going to accelerate my electrons, and when they go out, I'll apply a magnetic field, which is going to turn my electrons, and so they'll turn and they'll come back. Now, in the first acceleration, I have V on one axis. As these guys actually turn back, as they're in the region outside the capacitor, why don't I change the polarity of the capacitor. So when they come back, they will actually see a potential in the opposite direction. So what will happen? They will again be accelerated. So they will keep doing, actually rotating in larger and larger circles. So the way to do this is, so this is delta V plus the magnetic field. You take two metal objects, which are sort of like half cylinders, with a cut on the flat face. This is called a D, because it looks like a D. You take two of those, so one D here, another D here, and put it in a uniform magnetic field. Now here come our electrons from here. So 
I applied a voltage, they cross, they are now accelerated, they'll go on a circle, come to the other side, and I must now reverse the polarity as they complete half the circle. How much time does it take for these electrons to cover half the circle? Well, half the period we have found over here. It's going to be 2 pi over period over 2 is pi over qb over m. And that's independent of the velocity of the electrons. So how can I actually change the polarity of this capacitor? What's the time I need to change the polarity of the capacitor? Exactly half this time. That doesn't depend on the velocity of the electron. So instead of trying to reverse the polarity every time the electrons come, because they'll come at regularly spaced intervals, what I just need to do is put an alternating current source here. That's it. That alternating current source, tuned to the frequency of rotation of electrons, will keep accelerating electrons at higher and higher circles, and at the end you can actually shoot them out from a small decoupler at the edge. And really, it's a very small device. It requires only a modest magnetic field and an alternating current source. This can accelerate your electrons to point 9C. And after that, relativity comes into play and in relativity, this rotation frequency starts to depend on uh, your speed. So by applying any just alternating current, you cannot do that. There is another device, an improvement of the cyclotron. It's called a synchrotron, which syncs this rotation frequency with the alternating current. It can get to 0.95 speed of light. There is an improvement which was called betatron. It uses magnetic fields in a more novel way. And all the way, we've come to this large hadron collider now, which actually accelerates not electrons, but protons to 0.999 of speed of light. Okay? But the basic principle stays the same. You need magnetic fields plus charged particles crossing potential differences. That's how you accelerate particles. All right. Now, <coughs> let me talk about another practical use of this. By the way, I should have said this formula, Q V cross B, has a name. It's call, called the Lorentz force. Lorentz force. Now, and there's another very practical application. So I'll try to turn this into an example. Does, uh, how many of you here are in chemistry department? Is there anyone from the chemistry department? How about molecular biology? Just two people. So did you ever hear an object called mass spectrometer? Yes. What does that do? It can separate particles, individual particles of different, different molecules, if you want. So a mass spectrometer is a great device. You know, Let's talk about this uh, TV show, CSI. They find some sort of junk at the crime scene. They need to identify what molecules there are in that junk. What do they do? They take this, they take it to their mass spectrometer. And here's what the mass spectrometer does. At least the earliest versions were very, very simple. It was basically a device where there is a screen. 
and inside there is uniform magnetic field. And you take your junk, put it into a box. In this box, you run some very high voltage, so there is some spark or mean some other way of ionization of your molecules. And it, this, what I will call this magic box, sends all the particles with velocity V to the gap here. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and, uh, okay, let's think that I have two different masses, both of them moving with velocity v. What will the particle do when it enters from the small hole into the region with the magnetic field? It will actually start to rotate, right? It will rotate, I don't know what the charge is, and it will hit some place here, and old phosphorus screens, they actually glowed whenever a particle hit that. The old TVs worked like that. There was an electron beam that actually uh, adjusted the brightness on the screen. But how far away on the screen is that bright spot? Let's try to find out. We have already calculated in the previous lecture the radius of the circle. And this is half the circle. So this length must be 2 times mv over L is 2 times m v over q b. Now I told you that v is constant. So what b is something I actually give, that's a specification of my mass spectrometer. q, we know is for molecules, it must be quantized in units of electron charge, so it must be, it will be either one electron charge or two electron charge for a W ionized molecule. So what does this length measure? This length actually is proportional to the mass of the particles that are being accelerated. For example, if you just take water, you know, H2O, and put it into mass spectrometer, what will you see in the screen? You'll see a bright spot at, let's say, one centimeter. You'll see an other bright spot at 16 centimeters. And another bright spot at 18 centimeters. Why? Because if I'm accelerating hydrogen, hydrogen mass is one atomic unit. Oxygen mass is 16 atomic units. And sometimes the device actually ionizes the full H2O molecule, which has 18. There may even be, if there is the OH group that's accelerated through, there may even be a faint spot at 70. Yes. But looking at this data, you can immediately say, hey, there is hydrogen, there is oxygen in there, and the brightness ratios also tell you something about that. So you can actually find out very complex, the combination, the chemical composition of very complex molecules by just mass spectroscopy data. Now this is the simplest way, I and mean, this is basically, you can build this as a, as a class project, right? The simplest, and that, uh, so the magic is, is, is the device which sends all these molecules at the same velocity. But, now actually the systems are much more advanced. Okay, there, 
use a combination, a much cleverer combination of electric and magnetic fields to actually find out what atoms there are inside the molecule, what's the chemical composition of your molecule. Is there a comment? Maybe we're just, is there a switch? Yeah, to the best of our knowledge, there is no mass spec in particular. Really? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there must be a mass spectroscopy. I don't know. I, even even UNAM, I think, has a mass spectrometer. Maybe it's it's because you're a biologist, you like working with huge molecules, you know, proteins, and it's very hard to get protein composition from just mass spectroscopy. Now that's that's you need other chemical methods for that. Okay. But I'm sure even you know Adli Tup has mass spectrometer. I wasn't joking about CSI. Really, that's. That's uh, one of the standard things to have. But now, actually, uh, I told you we know magnetic field exists because it acts on the on moving particles. But if you look at the SI definition, standard international definition of magnetic field. It refers to another experiment, which is much easier to do. It's about the other thing. Let's talk about the force on a current carrying wire. So if I have a wire, a straight wire, of length L, which is carrying a current in the direction as shown. I can define a vector so this is going to be vector L. The direction is the current carrying direction of the wire. So for a straight wire, the magnetic force is proportional to the current, proportional to the length of the wire, but it's again in this combination L cross B. So for example, if I have this straight wire, in a magnetic field which is up in the page. Can you tell me which way the force is acting? I L cross B. So let's do that. L is to the right. I have my four fingers. I can orient my palm. I orient it in the direction of the second vector so that I close my four fingers to the second vector, my thumb tells me the direction of the force. It's coming out of the page. Okay, so this force F apparently should be So the force is apparently coming out of the page. So actual SI definition is SI definition of B is interesting. One Tesla of magnetic field. field creates one Newton of force on one meter of wire carrying one ampere current. Okay. So this is actually a simple experiment. Any kind of wire will feel the same 
sort of force as long as it carries current. So let's talk about this directionality. If my current is in the same way, looking the same way as my magnetic field. If my wire is directed in the same way, what's the force? Force is zero. So this force, much like the force on these moving particles, it tries to be perpendicular to the wire. All right. Now, how about the force if my wire is perpendicular to the magnetic field, the force is Q L cross B. So I should do it here. L is pointing up, magnetic field is to the line to the right. So it's L cross B is force is into the page. Right. And it scales with the length of the wire. So this is sort of a force per unit length. Okay? If I have a longer wire, then I'll have more force, but it's acting on a longer piece of wire. So I times B tells me the force per unit length that's acting on the wire. Now that's okay if I have straight wires, but as you know, generally to create uh, any sort of circuit, at some point, I need to bend the wires. So, here's the question. What if I have a bent wire in a non-uniform magnetic field? How do I calculate the force on such a wire? Why did you learn calculus? Exactly, for this reason. If you know how to do something for a straight wire, you should be able to do it for a curved wire by just using the concept of the differential. Right. So I can say the following. If I have a small section of this wire, instead of L, I'll have the small section of length DL. The force acting only on this section which I'll call df, will be I times dl cross b. So maybe this is the more central formula. Okay. I dl cross b tells me the force on the differential segment DL. And to find the total force, what I'll do is I'll just integrate this DF through all my wire. Okay. So let's actually solve an example. Let's say that I have a semicircular wire carrying Q 
current i as shown. And let's say that my magnetic field is, let's see, which way should it be? My magnetic field is uniform and into the page. Okay. So what is the direction and magnitude? of the total force. <coughs> How am I going to solve this? Well, I mean, I already told you, I have to split this into small parts, calculate the force on each part. But what do you think is the total direction? Or maybe, okay, let's, let's really do this slowly. And here's what I'll do. I'm going to redraw my circle, semicircle. Let's say I take a small section seen by angle d theta here now magnetic field is into the page so can you tell me which way does the force act on this object on this small section which way is df now this is DL. Magnetic field is into the page. So DL cross B, right? DL cross B is essentially radially outward, right? In the direction of the radius vector. So my DF in this way. So now, can you tell me, if this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, can you tell me which way will the total force point? Then I do my integration. It will point in the y direction. Why? Because of symmetry. If I have one section here, another section here, all the forces will be radially outward. Maybe I should use my pen. So the force will be always radially outward. If I sum up all these small dfs, my net force by symmetry will be along the y-axis. So by symmetry, total force will be along y. So here is what I'll do. Instead of calculating the total force, I will actually calculate the y component of the force for each of these objects. So can you tell me, in terms of this d theta, what is dl? And for that, I probably have to tell you the radius of my semicircle. dl will be r times d theta. What's the angle between the magnetic field and DL? Magnetic field is into the page, DL is inside the page, so they are perpendicular to each other. So I can say DL cross B is just DL times B. Okay? So it's going to be R times B times D theta. Nice. So what will be the magnitude of F? The magnitude of F is I times DL cross B magnitude. So apparently 
I times R times B times D theta. But do I actually need the magnitude of F or do I need the Y component? We've just said we have to add up the Y components. I should call this DF, right? It's a small. So the Y component, DFY. What's the Y component of DF? The angle I make with the X axis is theta. So it's going to be DF magnitude times sine theta. DFY will be DF magnitude times sine theta. So it's going to be I R B times sine theta d theta. So what will be the total force Fy? I need to integrate dFy integral I R B sine theta d theta. What's the smallest angle I should consider? I should consider integrating from zero theta. What's the maximum angle I should consider? I should consider pi or 180 degrees, right? So the integral should be from 0 to pi. I, R, and B are constants. Integral from 0 to pi sine theta d theta. What's the integral of sine theta? Minus cosine theta, that's great. Minus cosine theta at pi and zero. Cosine pi is minus one. So minus minus one is one. Cosine zero is one. Minus minus one is one. So this is two. So it's going to be i times two r times b. in the j hat direction. There is actually a simpler <coughs> explanation of this formula. If I have any wire from a starting point and an ending point, some strange wire, what's this formula telling me? I dl cross b. It's telling me that maybe I should think of this straight line from the starting point and ending point. Okay? And maybe I should treat <coughs> that as my L vector. Okay? Does it make sense here? What's the L vector from the starting point to the ending point? Its length is? 2r. What's my final answer? i times 2r times b. All right. So it's sort of a projection onto the line connecting the starting point to the ending point. Let me ask you a other question. What would be If instead of a semicircle, if I had a full circle, oh, sorry, full circle of radius R carrying a current I, what will be the total force on it? Why? One example, okay, that's a good good thing. I mean, I can have various reasonings. First of all, it's really independent of the magnetic field. If I have a uniform magnetic field B, okay, I will actually have the net force. It will be integral df. So it will be integral i dl cross b, right? But b is a 
uniform vector I can take it outside the integral I can write this as minus i okay i times integral dl cross b if b is uniform but what's integral dl it's the you're adding up the small vectors that form your wire if you come back to the same point this vector integral is zero for a, any closed loop so even if you did not have a perfectly circular wire but some you know strange loopy wire as long as it comes back to the same point the net force under a magnetic field that it's going to feel will be zero so even if I had a wire like this okay any any shape loop will have net force equal to zero does that mean that a magnetic field does not affect a loop of current because you know all of our circuits eventually are loops right we have a battery and electrons go through the circuit and come back to the other pole of the battery first of all I have assumed here that the magnetic field is uniform everywhere right so if magnetic field is acting only part of the circuit there will be forces felt there so the net force may depend on the magnetic field but if I have a uniform magnetic field and I have a loop does that mean there is no effect of the uniform magnetic field on a current loop let's solve an example I'll show you that while there is no net force that doesn't mean everything is equal to zero there will be an effect on the magnetic field so here's what I'll do let's take and I'll attempt a three-dimensional drawing so let's take a current loop in the xy axis and let's make it a square loop if you want so it's on the xy axis or let's make it rectangular l1 and l2 which is carrying a current i rectangular current loop is carrying current I as shown let's put in a magnetic field let's put in a nice magnetic field and which direction should it go it should go there is a uniform magnetic field let's say it's b0 times in the y direction so j hat find the forces on four sides of the rectangle hmm. let me try to draw a top view of this if I look at the system from the top there is a magnetic field uniform magnetic field B and here is my loop and I'm looking at it from the top so magnetic field uh, I'm sorry current is rotating like this
and I'm going to give numbers to the sides. Let's call this 1, 2, 3, 4. What's the force on the first side? The L vector is in the minus J direction. Minus J hat direction. Magnetic field is in the J hat direction. Remember, if the current and the magnetic field were parallel, net force is zero. So the first part has zero. How about the second part? Second. Here is my magnetic field. Here is my L vector. My L vector is like this. So I, I, L2 cross B. So this is L2 vector. L2 cross B, I need to orient my palm. It's better now. Okay. Towards B. L cross B. So this force is out of the page. Okay. So the force here is out of the page. Maybe I can write it better. I, L2 is in the I hat direction. So this is its length is L1. Sorry. Its length is L1 times I hat cross B is B0 times J hat. I hat cross J hat is K hat. So this is I L1 B0 times I cross J which is K hat. So the Force is coming out of the page. If I plot it in the three-dimensional figure, the force is coming out. What's the force on the third part? The third part is the, the lower part of the rectangle. Here again, L3 is in the direction of the magnetic field. So there is no force here. How about F4? It's going to be I L4 cross B. L4 is this. L4 cross B is now into the page. It's actually going to be I L1 times B0, but in the minus K head direction. So the force for will be opposite to that. What's the net force? The total force? It's zero, right? We have already proved that for any loop it has to be zero. But does that mean? So here is my current loop. The net force is zero. Its center of mass is not going to move. But on one hand I am pushing it up. On the other hand I am pushing it down. What would this loop do? It will rotate, right? So there is no net force, but there is a net torque on the system. So no net force, but net torque. Let's calculate this torque. The length here is L2 over 2. L2 over 2. So the net torque Torque is R cross F, but here, let's look at the magnitude. I have L over 2, well, it's called L2 over 2, right? L2 over 2 times F2 magnitude. Both torques are in the same direction. They are trying to rotate the object like this. So, L2 over 2 times F4. It gives me I L1 B0 times L2 over 2 times 2. So I L1 times L2 times B0. Hmm. What's L1 times L2? The area. Area of my loop. So we are going to define a new object. We'll call the magnetic moment of a loop as a current 
times the area vector of any loop and we'll say the torque on any loop is mu cross b and we'll actually discuss what this formula means in detail on Wednesday. Okay?